We got any uh, medical appointments on it. Right. Well, we'll just uh, we'll just plan on that. Where are you going? We're going to Aspen. Oh, are you? All right. That's not just for a vacation. Well, Ryan Ruth and I've got a condo. Right. And uh, they're going up. Uh, they're going up Friday. I see. I see. And uh, going to be there a couple of days, and then we're going to join them for ten days. Right. Right. And then we'll be coming back. Good. Well, tell me where. Uh, tell me about yourself. You, you you went to Texas A&M, obviously, right? Right. And uh, where, I'm a graduate. Where did you grow up? I grew up in, in Lot, Texas. You know where Lot is? Yeah. Sure. Sure. That was my hometown, and right. Uh, uh, I graduated from high school there. Uh huh. And like so many other farm boys, you know, I sat out on farm and watch the airplanes go by so I said one of these days I'm gonna fly one of those and I did right but anyway that's a long story <laughs> <laughs> so you uh but you came to Texas A&M did you always want to come to A&M yeah but I wasn't able to when I graduated from high school because uh, financial situation right and uh, so I joined the Air Force or Air, Air Corps I guess it was at Randolph in 1940, mm -hmm. and uh, they sent me to uh, Chinoot Air Force Base up in Illinois for mechanic school, and uh, I was supposed to come back to Randolph, but they kept me up there as an instructor, mm -hmm. and I, I stayed up there for two years, I guess, uh, as an instructor, and then when they broke, broke up the school at, at uh, Chinoot, they divided it in three ways. Third of it went to uh, a Shepherd Air Force Base, which Tall Fall, and a third of it went to Biloxi, Mississippi, and a third of it stayed at Chinook. Mm -hmm. And they gave us a, a choice, you know. Mm -hmm. Where did we want to go? So I said, well, I'm being an old Texan, I'm going back to, <laughs> going back to Shepherd A. Field. Right. Well, I, I spent... Uh, I guess about nearly three years at, at Chipper, and uh, things got so bad in, in the school that uh, seemed like uh, there must be a better place. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, I put in for aviation cadet and uh, was accepted on Halloween day. <laughs> I see. And... Uh, well, I went from there to Blackland, San Antonio, mm -hmm. and from San Antonio to uh, what's the name of the little town? Anyway, I, I took basic training at. Uh, I can't even think where I, where I went now, but anyway, mm -hmm. I. They had divided it up, you know, where you get nine weeks of pre-flight, nine weeks of basic, nine weeks of ad, in uh, advanced, and then nine weeks in, in the final nine weeks, you got to go to uh, multi-engine or single engine. Right. So I went from there. I went from uh, primary to. Uh, Basic training in in uh, at Goodfellow Air Force Base. Right. And then from at, there I went to Lubbock. To Reese. Which was that time was Lubbock Army Air. Lubbock Army Air Force if you're right, sure. And uh, graduated in in uh, November, I guess it was. And then they sent us to either multi-engine or single engine, and I uh, chose multi-engine, so I went to uh, Rattlesnake Bomber Base. Where was that? <laughs> uh, it was um, down between uh, well, it's between San Antonio and and, uh, and uh, New Rifles? 
No, it's further, further south. Okay. Anyhow, we got to gather a crew together, you know, down there. And, and uh, oh, we flew a few hours, but not very much as a crew. And they sent us to advanced uh, crew training, I guess you'd call it, at Alexandria, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And from there, we got orders to go to England. Now, what were you flying? We were flying B-17. B-17, okay. And you were piloting? I was. I went as a co-pilot right. to begin with. Mm -hmm. I finally got to be a pilot, but, right. but that was uh, after we flew combat. So. I see. I see. So what year are we now? When, when did you... When did you go to England? In 19 and, let's see, 1945, I guess it was. Okay. Anyway, anyway uh, I, was, I was assigned to the Is that your unit? I was assigned to 8th Air Force uh, uh, 499th Squadron. Uh huh. And uh, the 499th was uh, the night flying squadron. I see. We had uh, three regular squadrons and, and a night flying squadron on the base at Chelveston. And uh, I spent the first half of my tour at Chelveston and then they, they broke us up again and, and we went to Cheddington which is right outside of London. Mm -hmm. This was uh, so we could be close to Eisenhower's headquarters. I see. And uh, we uh, we flew all over the occupied countries from the Pyrenees Mountains to North Circle and uh what were the nature of your missions well we we uh, we dropped a leaflet leaflets uh you might get an idea better what we did by looking at that book right there right here that other one. this uh, one okay oh i see that yeah i remember your uh this that uh, bill yunkin did Anyhow, leafing through there, it shows you a lot of the leaflets that we dropped. And I say, I used to have a lot of that stuff, but uh, when I moved, I just got rid of everything. I see. I see. So this was, uh, this was a lot of what you did. Yes. You flew the Flying Fortress? I flew the Flying Fortress the whole time. Anyhow, a good friend of mine wrote that uh -huh. and, and got all the information together and he sent me a copy of it. Wow. He's an English, an Englishman. Are you, I see this one picture. Are you in the book elsewhere? No, not really. That's, that was our crew. Uh-huh. Right here. Right. And, and uh, that's me right there. Right here? Yeah. Miss Mickey Finn. Well, that was one of the ships we flew. One of the ships, yeah. And this is the one we got shot up in. Oh, was that right? So you flew in that one? Yeah. We flew it the last mission. It was a shot up that just pushed off in the ocean, I guess. So is this the description right here on May 12, 1944? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. 50 officers and men flying in five aircraft took off on a leaflet mission to Denmark. B-17-423-1032 JJB flown by Lieutenant Michael. Yep. That was your pilot? That was our pilot. Was attacked by a Junkers JU-88, which killed its two waste gunners, Sergeants George Barber and Robert Walker. Both Sergeant Lewis Hayton, the radio operator, and Sergeants Nicholas Mestriani, the tail gunner, were badly wounded. Tail Sergeant Dan Brennan 
The ball turret gunner also received serious injuries as a result of the attack, but succeeded in beating off the Ju-88 before shooting it down. On return to the UK, the B-17 landed at RAF Riston, where the dead and injured were taken off the aircraft and the flak damaged and inspected. Note number two engine has been feathered. Well, we were lucky to even get back, I'll tell you. I bet you were. They made a mess of our airplane. Like I say, they just pushed it off in the ocean when we got back, because they said there wasn't anything worth salvaging. What What do you specifically remember about about this mission? You were the co-pilot, right? You were in the right. you were in the right seat. Right. What do I remember? Yes, sir. I remember that hail of bullets as it <laughs> right hit the airplane. It sounded just like hail on a tin roof. And uh, from both the attack and the flak, or what? This was an attack. This was an attack by Ju-88 or right. two Ju-88s. Right. And uh, the, the first one really did us in, and the second one, when he started shooting, well, our, our uh, gunners were on him, and he blew up. And uh, why the first guy didn't come back, I don't know, but he didn't. Uh-huh. And I say, we, we were about 24,000 feet when this happened, I guess. Right. Course they shot out our oxygen, they shot out all our radios, and most of our uh, uh, navigation equipment. Uh-huh. And uh, so uh, we had to come down because we didn't have any oxygen. Right. And uh, as we, they shot out number two engine, and, and uh, we started down in a pretty steep dive to get down to where we could breathe and uh, number four engine went out but we managed to get both of them feathered mm -hmm. and uh, so we flew for seemed like a a long time and it was i guess <clears throat> this happened just just off the coast of denmark mm -hmm. as we went into the north sea and uh, the uh, flux gate compass that we use for normal navigation was shot out. And the only compass we had was a little liquid compass like they use in automobiles. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know when it had ever been swung, mm -hmm. or whether it was in, but it wasn't very accurate. Right. But I figured if I put it on 270, we're bound to hit England somewhere. But uh, you know we wouldn't have if, if they hadn't if we hadn't found out where we were. Uh, we uh, tooled along seemed like forever, just right at stall speed, you know, with two engines gone, and we threw out everything that that uh, would lighten the airplane. That is after after we got down to a lower altitude, and then I say uh, the. Uh, Lieutenant Michaels went back in the back and he was trying to help the people that were uh, wounded and, and so forth. And so uh, he he says, you got it, and he turned, he turned it over to me. And, and uh, like I say, I just put it in a steep dive and we went down to about 1,200, 12,000 feet and then uh, started to level level out. And uh, believe it or not, the uh, vacuum system that ran the uh, automatic, uh, the the, uh, the uh, horizon, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, was shot out too, and. I couldn't understand why we kept losing altitude, and, and according to the instruments, we were level. And the first thing you know, I could look at the side of the wind, uh, the side of the airplane, and there wasn't anything out there but water. So, so I got to checking. What, what time of day was this? Oh, it was about 
two o'clock in the morning, I guess. Okay, so it's pitch black. Oh, it's pitch black. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I finally realized that the vacuum had been shot out, vacuum pump had been shot out, and so B-17 has two, one on either side, so I switched to the one that was still good, and our uh, artificial horizon then came back to where it should be, you know. And so I was able to level out about 12,000 feet or maybe a little less and, and uh, right at stall speed almost. And we kept flying at, two, at 270 degrees, which should have taken us to England, I thought. But uh, we flew and flew and flew and kept losing altitude and losing altitude. And finally got down to about 3,500 feet before we began to hold altitude. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had flown long enough, I figured that we should have been over England. So I called the navigator, I says, have you got anything down there that works? And he said, I'll go see. So <laughs> he came back in a few minutes, he said, well, the G box may be working. And that was what we used for drop and everything else as far as uh, news, newspapers and so forth. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was like uh, accurate to uh, about a 50 yards, I guess, in any mm -hmm. direction. Yeah. We, uh, we, uh, He says, you know, if, if that G-box is working, he says, you need to make a 90 degree turn to the right. And so, so I did, and you know, we, we hadn't more than turned to the right until we were picked up by the lights, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I use these lights to uh, direct you to a, a field. A field. Uh -huh. If you had no communication, and we had none. But the, the CW set was still working and the, and the uh, radio man sat back there and pounded out SOS until we were back over England. That's the only reason I know what, where we went. Mm -hmm. But we were going right down the middle of the, of the uh, English Channel and if we hadn't turned, <laughs> we'd go. We'd gone on and out of the right. Atlantic. Right. But we uh, we turned, and I say it, almost immediately we were picked up by these lights, and they kept waving them which way they wanted us to go. And uh, of course, they didn't know how bad we were shot up or anything. Mm-hmm. And we ended up way up in uh, in uh, Scotland mm -hmm. before they gave us clearance to land. And uh, we knew that it was going uh, to make a heck of a noise or something when they landed because the ball turret, they got the ball turret man out but left his guns pointing straight down. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they landed us on a, a fighter field, which is this PSP planking, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and when we hit, finally hit the ground, you never heard such a racket. Oh, man. <laughs> and uh, we've, we've almost immediately came to a stop because, like I say, the gun barrels hit, hit the runway and uh, and we found out later that they had shot the tail wheel off so we were dragging, dragging the tail end of the airplane also. Goodness. <laughs> but we, uh, we managed to make it all right and... And uh, where were you in Scotland? Do you know where? Well, it was on the east east uh, east coast, east side of. The, I see. But I couldn't tell you the name of the field. Oh, the name of the field. Oh. But anyway, it's up up around what they call the Wash. Uh huh. And uh, we were so happy to get on the ground. <laughs> oh, I imagine. After all this confusion that we'd been through. That uh, they sent us onto the barracks to spend the rest of the night, and they they took the two men that were 
Well, one of, one of my gunners lived until he got, almost got back to England. Mm -hmm. The other one was killed almost immediately. And uh, they took them, of course, to the hospital or wherever they took them in an ambulance. And they sent us to quarter so we could get some rest. Right. And so the next morning we went out just to see how bad the airplane was shot up and and I don't see how the airplane flew. Mm -hmm. <laughs> flew. It it had big holes through the propeller and and, and Right. And uh, a lot of the uh, cooling fins on the cylinders were shot off, I guess you'd say. But anyway, we had two good engines that were still running, and, and we managed to make it back. So don't let anybody tell you it won't fly on two engines. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, it, it, you proved it can. How many, how many combat missions did you fly in England? I flew 50. 50? And was this, was this the closest you came to it being your last? I guess this one was your most memorable as far as... Yeah, this was about halfway through. Right. In fact, it was, I guess, the last mission before we moved to Cheddington. Uh-huh. And uh, the rest of the missions were... Uh, well, they weren't they weren't uh, milk runs or anything like that. But I say the rest of them were not not quite as exciting as that. Not quite as exciting. But we had had two two missions before that that turned out to be very exciting. One one was uh, down to uh, the submarine pens mm -hmm. of uh, that they had set up in France, and we went down there. <laughs> One night, we were, we were going to uh, test out some new bombs that we'd... For a while, we, we dropped these things loose, and of course, they'd scattered all over the countryside. Mm -hmm. So they, they figured out, well, you put these in a bomb, and then put an aneroid fuse on it, right? and uh, have it open about maybe 3,500 feet or something like that to get pretty good coverage. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we took the squadron navigator and went down to St. Nazaire to uh, make a first drop on these bombs. And of course, he, he was interested in making making sure they all opened and so forth. And so he said, "Okay, we'll we'll drop these things." And said, "Everybody, keep an eye out and see see them." burst, you know. He said, you ought to be able to see this black powder burst. So we we were sitting there like sitting duck, you know, watching for these things. And we started counting, you know, and, and we had 10 of them. But when you got to 11, 12, 13, we, re we realized it wasn't the bombs we were seeing, it was back act. Uh -huh. And of course we went into uh, all kinds of maneuvers trying to get get out of the flak, and uh, we managed to kind of get out of the flak and around Saint Nazaire, and we were going back then across France to to England, and I guess they sent up a, fly, a fighter plane, and this fighter plane sat right behind us, not close enough that we could shoot at it, or it could shoot at us. But he sat back there and radioed, radioed our airspeed, height, speed, and everything. <laughs> and so we fought flak all the way back across France, everywhere they had an emplacement. Well, we uh, were dodging flak. Mm -hmm. But we made it back all right. And then I say, we had another very exciting mission where we, we dropped our load and started back to England and and uh, we lost an engine and, and this engine sat back there and just and we couldn't feather it so it sat there and just rotated you know until it burned all the oil out of it and then it looked, looked like a pinwheel you know mm -hmm. <laughs> sparks 
And we got to, back to England and they said, well, you can land at this little fighter strip just right over the, uh, the uh, banks of Dover. And uh, so we were fighting the controls all the way back because the airplane was shaking. You couldn't sure. read the, couldn't right. read the, the instruments. <laughs> and uh, so we finally got lined up to uh, to land in this little field. We come right over the, the uh, banks of, of Dover there, and and uh, just as we got ready to land, they said, "Pull it up, go around." I said, "We got a fighter plane that." that uh, ground loop running on the runway. <laughs> so so we pulled it up and like you say, I think we just held it up by yeah. brute force. And we made the 270 degree turn and came back in and landed okay. But it was a little grass field and we ended up rolling right up to the fence around, <laughs> around the base. But I say this was a pretty exciting little base. Uh, I guess it caught a lot of the people that <coughs> that came in, you know, that were in, in bad trouble. And the next morning when we went down to the, the field again, uh, there was a B-25 sitting right next to, the, to our B-17. And it had one hole right in the nose. And they said, it, hit the navigator right square in the head mm -hmm. and killed him. And then that afternoon we had a uh, another airplane come in there that was on one engine. It was a B-26. And, uh, and they gave him clearance to land and he started to make a left turn to the final approach and and I guess he decided that the jettison the, the uh, canopy so they could get out in case in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And they jettisoned the canopy and it went right into, right into the the good engine. Oh my goodness! So they landed across the field, mm -hmm. and they said the guns were hot and everything else. So, uh, but they made a successful landing and and. Uh, all three of the guys, there's just three people in the B said B six B twenty six, I guess it was. Mm-hmm. And they all got out all right, but boss it tore up that airplane but good, you know, when they, they landed short like that. Right. But I say that was an exciting little airfield right down on the coast. But I say we we had all kind of things happen to us. We got a brand new B-17s in. We we had lost a couple. Yeah. So we got two new ones in, and the the uh, ops officer and, and his buddy decided they'd go out and fly one of them. And right. <laughs> they got off the ground somehow or another, and then uh, the uh, engines quit on them. Yeah. <laughs> and. They landed right off the end of the runway, and and uh, and all the people on the airplane got off, but it it, it burned right there at the end of the runway. Yeah. So I said we had all kinds of exciting things go on over there. I guess weather was really well, the weather was terrible. I say we made yeah. we took off from two different missions uh -huh. and they told us there's no possibility you're landing working in England that uh, you can come back and try but there's not much possibility of your landing and so we came back I guess the first time and uh, they sent us back way back in up in, in Scotland and mm -hmm. we, we were able to land yeah. And the second time we were sent down to a naval base on, uh, in. Uh, you need to get that. No. I'm, okay. They'll get. Okay. Okay. Uh, second time we landed at Lands End, which is right down on the uh, English Channel. Right. And uh, 
we were able to land down there, but yeah, it's pretty pretty spooky to take off and they say there's no place to land when you get back. Right. Well you were able to you were able to find them. But we were able to land both times. Right. But I say when we were told that we were not be we probably would not be able to land in England at all. It pretty almost shakes you up. I guess. Talk about, I'm reading here in, in this about your 50th mission, you, you tried to take a shortcut? Yeah, we did. <laughs> and that almost turned out not too good? <laughs> we got hit by a friendly flag. I see. Either English or American, I don't know which. Right. And I say that tail gunner brought a little piece of flak back at about six or eight inches long. Uh-huh. He said it came up right between his legs and hit his gun barrels. Right. But anyway, we had some excitement. Right. <laughs> now, I read where after the Battle of the Bulge, you uh, you dropped some more leaflets on the the Germans after the Battle of the Bulge during the surrender. Yeah. We dropped a, a lot of leaflets, uh, surrender leaflets. Uh-huh. And uh, we got good reports back that that the Germans used a lot of them. Right. And uh, we, uh, we we went out uh, on D-Day and and uh, or pre-D-Day, I should say. Right. And dropped uh, leaflets to the French, you know, to get off the coast. Right. And I had never seen so many boats in my life going across that English Channel. I think he could have walked across. My goodness. So your 50th mission, I guess, was, it was after the Battle of the Bulge, so it was in, in 1945? Yeah. When, when did you come home? Well, I finished my missions in, uh, in August, I guess it was. Of 45? Yeah. Uh-huh. And then uh, they had a bunch of new crews come in to take over. And right. uh, they, I, they kept me there to fly the new crews to uh, orient them on the navigation and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I spent about six weeks, I guess, after I finished my missions. Right. Uh, in England. Uh huh. And I got back in uh, I guess October. I got back in. Uh, forty-five. 45. So the war was the war was over now. Is that right? Well, it was over in England. Over in England. In in, uh, in Europe. Right. Did you think that you were going to be assigned to to go to Japan then, or? <laughs> Well, I came back and they they sent me to Laredo, uh -huh. and uh, we were flying uh, gunnery missions in there, and most of the gunners, of course, had been had flown in England, and uh, some of these guys were pretty skittish about what what they wanted to do or what they what happened, and we had a, took off one morning to. Uh, go on a gunnery mission and and I had one guy that uh, he said he he was he was ready to jump out of the airplane hmm. we had what happened one of the engineer or something got overbalanced or something and he banged into the, the uh, panel that had all the electrical uh, wires and so forth in it and it set the uh, soundproofing on fire and it got pretty smoky in there mm -hmm. and he was all ready to jump out he <laughs> he I guess jumped out in in England somewhere but anyway mm -hmm. I say we, we had a lot of excitement yeah so you came back to the States, you were assigned to, to uh, Laredo Air Force Base? Yes, and I say I stayed down there for about 
six months, I guess, and mm -hmm. and I had enough points to get out. Mm -hmm. So I, well, they they were sending a lot of us to uh, B 29s and I was just about ready to get on orders to go to B 29s and I said, well, I've had enough of this combat. I'm not going to get if I don't have to. And they said, well, you've got enough points to get out, you can get out. So I got out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed out almost a year, and uh, I worked for the VA and several people, several outfits there in Waco, Texas, and uh, I guess well, I was working for the Ford people. Four tractor people, mm -hmm. and they got to the point where the uh, Ford uh, manufacturing people were not able to produce uh, enough equipment to to keep the agencies supplied, so. I volunteered to go back into the Air Force, and uh, I went back in and and uh, I was assigned to uh, a reserve outfit in in, in uh, Well, I guess it, I guess it was uh, in Grand Prairie. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was a joint Air Force and Navy outfit, and I hadn't been there but just a very short time till I got orders to go overseas again. I see. And I went to went to Guam. Uh huh. In fact, I was supposed to go to Okinawa, but. Uh, they had had a typhoon on Guam and had uh, wrecked a lot of the uh, hangars and storage buildings, and, and uh, I guess it pretty well mixed up all the supplies and so forth. And since I'd been in in the uh, aircraft repair business they pulled me off in on Guam and and uh, I spent about a year and a half on Guam most of the time re-identifying equipment that had been <clears throat> either water soaked or something by by the typhoon I see and uh, wow and I came back to uh, Fort Worth at uh, Carswell Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and we were, we were given the first three B-36s that came off the line, and told them told us to let go with the tests on them, and where, where they sent us. Uh, it was Rapid City, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. They couldn't have thought of a colder place. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, they had built a huge hangar at, at Rapid City, which is still there, I guess. Uh, supposedly, they could put, put B-36, two B-36s in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, we never did get two in there. We, we uh, Usually had other airplanes that need to get in there, and uh, so we put one B-36 and we put a C-47 and a and a small airplane or something under each wing and so forth. But anyway, we had a a hangar chief that that was a a real character. They had put in, put. Uh, hot water pipes, you know, in all the floor and everything, keep 
keep it warm in the winter time. Mm -hmm. So we'd close the door at night, you know, and and when we get there in the morning, well, it's pretty good, pretty, pretty warm in the huge big hangar. Mm -hmm. First thing you do is open the doors and move out the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We we spent some exciting weather time in in uh, South Dakota. I'll bet. And like I say, uh, those three airplanes, I don't think uh, flew probably 50 hours the whole time we were up there, because there was something wrong with them all the time. I see. And uh, we we. Uh, We fought the weather, like I say, most of the time. Yeah. But yeah. anyway. Yeah. To make a short, long story short, well, I, my discard, discharge came up, and and I got out again. Mm-hmm. And uh, drove down to Carsville Air Force Base in Fort Worth and re-upped. And I, they put me in charge of. A, AT-60s, I had about six of them to look after, and so I thought this was a good deal, you know. Uh-huh. These were trainer, trainers? Yeah. Uh-huh. And I, like I say, I I lived in Lot. I had a home there, so I, had, I moved back to Lot. Yeah. And uh, I drove back and forth to the base every day. It was like a civilian job, almost. But then... Uh, what year was What year was this now? That was when Castro uh, acted it. Okay. And uh, they called me, recalled me to. Late 50s? Are we talking about 50s? Yeah. When were you in South Dakota? Do you remember the. 40. 49, I guess, up there. Uh huh. Anyhow, I came so, back to Waco and. Mm hmm. And uh, then when Castro acted up, they really called me to active duty, and I took a refresher course, and, and they sent me down to San Marcos. Mm -hmm. And I spent almost three years down there in the back seat of a trainer, you know, teaching Army personnel how to fly. Mm -hmm. Basic train, real basic stuff. In fact, we, we started out with Aronka chiefs, and then we finally ended up with uh, uh, PT-13s, which is a uh, uh, which is the the. Uh, the bird dog, I guess the army called them. Mm -hmm. Is it? They're, uh, they used them in Vietnam all the time to as spotters and so forth. Right. And uh, but I say we we went through Aronkas and then we went through. Uh, Two or three different uh, different kinds of airplanes before we ended up with the bird dog, mm -hmm. and uh, then they decided that my engineering officer decided I needed to be a, a, a helicopter pilot. So really, so I went through helicopter school then, and. I had no more than graduated from helicopter school until they decided it was going to close the base. So they sent me from uh, San Marcos to to Austin, and uh, while I was in Austin, well, I I got a call back to. To uh, Chinook as a uh, 
was a commander anyway of, of the when these uh, groups that you know went around and, and talked. Uh huh. Uh, new personnel, I guess you'd say, or orientation type things. Yeah. Uh, on the KC-135 and and uh, B-29, B. Be what? This was in Illinois. This this was. Uh... I know it's been a long time. Chanute is in El is in Illinois. Is that right? Yeah. Then, like I say, uh, Chanute. Uh, Chanute was my headquarters, but I right. said we had this uh, mobile training detachment. I see. And uh, we checked everybody out that's supposed to have been checked out at Bergstrom, and so they they sent me then to Maxwell, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found out they didn't need me over there, so they sent me back to Chanute, to mm -hmm. headquarters. Right. And then I, I finished my tour of duty as a uh, in the instrument department of the mechanic school mm -hmm. at Chinook. And uh, I had a real good first sergeant of the outfit that I was in, and he took care of most of all the business. And so I ended up flying the base commander around. Mm. He had a, a C-47 that was all uh, I guess you'd say pretty up on the inside, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, he used to scare the dickens out of me on flying that airplane. I mean, I, I flew as an instructor pilot uh -huh. with him. Right. <laughs> He'd take off and he put that airplane in climb and all the red light, I mean, red lines had come in. I said, sir, I think you're doing this a little bit too fast. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we survived. And, uh, and I stayed there until I, I uh, retired. In 62? I retired in 62. And then you went back to Texas A&M. Is that right? I came back to Texas A&M and got, got two degrees. Uh-huh. A degree in uh, in education, is that right? Yeah. Industrial education. Industrial education. And then... Uh, What'd you do with that? So you finished, it, you got your degree in, looks like what, in 64 and then in 69? Well, I... Master's in 69. I went to... I taught school at Bryan for a couple of years. Uh-huh. And... Uh, While you were going to school? No. After you got after out. After I got out. I see. After I got the first degree, let's right. put it that way. Right. What'd you teach? I taught uh, mostly, I guess you'd say manual arts. Mm-hmm. Woodworking, metalworking. Uh, I see. Uh, motor repair. And yeah. This kind of stuff. Right. But anyway, uh, I had a good friend that was in personnel out at A&M, and he called me up one day and he says, hey, would you be interested in a job out here? And I says, well, what kind of a job? And he said, well, Earl Rudder just established a new position as a surplus procurement officer. And he said, would you like to come and investigate it? And I said, well, yeah, I sure would. <laughs> and so, um, I was hired as a, as a surplus procurement officer out there, mm -hmm. and I did that for about almost 18 years. I see. All through the Vietnam area and so forth. Right. And most of the early NASA flights. Mm -hmm. And we and I guess I picked up uh, several million dollars worth of surplus equipment. Mm -hmm. Most of it's still good equipment, but <coughs> uh, 
surplus to the needs of NASA or to the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, brought it into A&M for use out here in the various departments. Mm -hmm. And I say, uh, I did that for about 17, 18 years and retired again. I see. <laughs> and I've been retired since 1982. 82, so that's when you you retired from A&M. Yeah. I see. So, I had good life. Yeah, you have. How old are you? 87. 87. Tell me about your family. Well, I have uh, three children. Mm-hmm. And uh, my son Don is retired from the Air Force now, and he works for a computer outfit in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ruth Ann and, and Ron here in, in uh, right. Brian. And, and Brian, my youngest son, is mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. So he's here with us. I see. That's Brian that I just met yeah, out there. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, my wife had uh, heart surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been in 19 and 52. Oh, no, 62. Right. And uh, she really had never recovered from that surgery, mm -hmm. but she ended up with Alzheimer's. I see. And she's out at Hudson Creek Alzheimer's Special Care Unit. I see. How long have y'all been married? 65, 66 years. Wow. So <laughs> So you married after you got back? No, I married or, before I went. Before you went, okay. And uh, my daughter, Ruth Ann, was born while I was in England. I see. So uh, we've, had a, we've had a good life up until my wife went into Alzheimer's. Got sick, yeah, but yeah. I can't say much for the situation right now. Right. She oh, that's tough. Slowly, slowly going where she doesn't even know anything. Oh, it's tough. That's tough. I'm so sorry. So how many grandkids do you have? I've got, uh, well, Don's got two children, and uh, and Ruth Ann's got one. Uh-huh. And then Kim has got two great-grandkids. I see. And then... One of the grand, one of their great great kin, grandkids has got a son, so I got a great great grandchild. <laughs> I'll be darn. What's your wife's name? Your wife's name? Ruth. Ruth. Okay. Okay. Anyway, uh, I say I can't complain. No, we've had a good life, and unfortunately, what's what's happened right now is is is, is not good. Right. Right, right. But I've been invited to, Brian and I have been invited to stay with Ron Ruth Ann as long as we want to. I figure they're going to kick us out one of these days. Oh, I'll bet not. <laughs> I'll bet. Any, anyway, we, uh, we've been enjoying life as far as what they've offered us here. Flying Fortress. Those were, uh, they look like big airplanes, but you get inside of them and there's not much, not much, not much room to maneuver, is there? Not much. They landed one out here, oh, a year <laughs> or so ago, yeah. out here at Easterwood, and I got to crawl all through it. And I thought, boy, that must have been, especially with that flat going, you got, you rattled around inside that thing, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. No, I say when we got shot up, we got, I got about three 30 caliber bullet holes in the, a bullet hit, I guess it say, in the back of my seat. Right. But fortunately, that 
they were stopped by uh, armor plate. But unfortunately, the the two gunners, they had nothing nothing really to right. protect them. And I said one of them lived until we got back to England and died before we landed. The other one was killed immediately. And I say, uh, my navigator and my and my pilot went back to to um, attend to the people that were wounded. Right. And they had a time getting the ball turned gunner out. Yeah. Because the electric motor or something that that uh, moved that ball turn didn't work, so they had to, had to grind him out by hand. Oh my goodness! And uh, I say he was hit three times, I guess. The tail gunner got hit twice, and the radio got radio man got hit once. Is this? Uh... Was this a, a reunion of something, or yeah, that or that's gonna be? It, they have one every year. So it's coming up in Colorado Springs, right? I just got that the other day. I've never been to one of their reunions. So what squadron were you? I was a four, three, four, uh, four twenty second, four twenty second. Okay, four twenty second squadron. Right. Of the 305th Bombardment Group. Right. Of the 8th Air Force. Of the 8th Air Force. And I say, well, when we transferred to Chittington, yeah. we were put in the 8th uh, Composite Command. 8th Composite Command, I see. And I say, we were right close to, they put us down into uh, <coughs> Chittington, which is right near Eisenhower's headquarters. Right. And uh, so we could get the most current information for our newspapers and so forth. Did you ever come in contact with the general? No, I never did. Mm -hmm. Well, this is fascinating. Can I borrow these things and give them back to you? Sure. Because this will help me with my preparation for, yeah, the, I, for the show. And I, I will take very good care I of I would sure like to get them back. Now. Oh, you will. Oh, you, I, I, will, I, will, I will deliver them back to you. I've had... Uh, and uh, you, I promise you I will take very, very good care of them. But this will help me in preparation. Do you have... I, I noticed th this photograph is, is great. Um, and you say you got rid of most everything. Do you have this photograph that... Uh, that Bill Yunkin used this uh, this mug shot. Do you have that anywhere around? This I, one. I tried to locate it, but I couldn't find it. I don't this know one what, here. Well, Ruth Ann got it or not? She may have it. Okay. Well, I might call Ruth Ann, or you might, if you look for it or something like that, if she has it, I might. Uh, what I want to do is I'll, I'm going to scan some of these things so they'll be ready for the show when we do it. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we plan on that Thursday the twenty? Fourth, which would be two weeks from uh, be two weeks from this Thursday, because you say you got to get back on that Tuesday, yeah. the twenty second. So that'll give you a couple of days to rest from your from your trip. And if you're doing all right, what I'll do is I'll plan to give you a call on the twenty third on Wednesday. And uh, you, I guess you know your way around A and M. You know where K A M U is, oh, don't yeah. you? Where the TV station is sure. there, right there on Houston Street, right, sure. right near the former students' building, or they're they're redoing the former students' building now. But that's where it is, and we we usually tape at two thirty in the afternoon. And uh, can you get there yourself? And yeah, and you drive and all that. Okay, that's good. But I tell you what, don't, don't worry about this until I'll give you a call on that Wednesday after you get back. Okay. The 23rd and confirm that you're still okay to, to do it on the 24th. And what we do is, you've seen the show. Uh, just recently, I don't know if you've seen the show 
in the last couple of weeks, but we've changed up the uh, the set just a little bit. Uh, the last couple of shows that I've done, most of the shows that I've done for the last three years, you're sitting in a chair and I'm sitting in a chair about this far away. Well, we've changed it up to where we're both sitting at a desk and I'm a little bit closer to you than the previous shows that I've done and that way I don't have to yell at you okay. and we can just have a conversation. I like the set a whole lot better. But it's a 30 minute show and uh, I'll just sort of lead the conversation and you, we'll do just essentially what we're doing right now. We won't be able to take quite as much time and we'll move a little bit quicker from one okay. subject to, a, no, to another. Obviously, I want to spend a lot of time on on your memorable mission, obviously, and uh, and some of your other missions and, and your, uh, uh, your work after you got out and your work at Texas A&M as we have time. But I think it'll be a great show. I really do. And well, I appreciate your service. I hope so. Oh, but I think it will be. It's very easy to do. And the show will actually air probably about three or four weeks after we tape it. So it probably won't air till August sometime. Okay. Sometime in August. It'll swing. It'll actually be on the air. But I'll be sure to give you and Ron and Ruth a, a DVD of the show and, and all of that. Uh, so, uh, appreciate so, so we'll do that. But thank you for your service. Well. Mainly, I always be sure and thank everybody for their service. Because, uh, Veterans mean a whole lot to me. Mayor is walking the fence. He's getting ready to, ready to drop a baby, and I, he's like, I got seventy thousand five hundred dollars worth of stud fees in there. He's like, I ain't coming home for that babies on the ground. Now you're a horseman, huh? You ride? Uh, I did. Uh huh. Is this your saddle? Some, uh, well, that was my granddad's saddle That's and granddad. my dad's, and then mine. Yeah. And I keep that over there so that. If I get to feeling a little bit self-satisfied, I can look at that sucker and tell where I came from. Yes, sir. <laughs> wow. That's uh, amazing. That's a saddle. That's amazing. Uh, that's was made in 1872. Goodness gracious. Got the old stockman's whip and my anchor spurs and... Well, I want to, uh, if I may, um, well, you, you got these pictures. You got any other uh, any any other pictures from your service? No. Okay. Well, this is fine. Can I take uh, can I can I take that picture and give it back to you on Wednesday? I'm gonna get back. I'm gonna give them back to you on Wednesday. I just want to scan. Be careful of my pipe there, boy. That's the same pipe I had. That, that was taken 55 years ago. Really? That's the same pipe I had in my mouth when I took the picture. Dog, get away from there with your tail. Come on. I'll be darn. Oh, you were telling now you were telling me about the, the dog. I, oh, yeah. Fun, right? Anyway, they went down there and he had no hair because he, he had no muscle, no, no nothing left. Uh huh. Come here. And uh, he weighed about 20 some odd pounds. They brought him back up, took the bird shot out of him, and, and gave him some IV and some food. And he was so far down, nobody looked at him. Uh huh. And uh, my, I, uh, well, the family's been involved with the shelter for years. Right. And I'd get down there and scratch some ears because my old dog that I had for 20 years had died on me about uh -huh. a year before. Uh huh. And I would walk in there one day and he was just a, flopped out half dead on the on the floor in one of those pens. And the boy, poor devil, what happened? They told me. And. Uh, the poor devil walked on around, came back and went by the damn thing, and he struggled up on his elbows, looked up, and went wimp. That was it. Too. <laughs> that was it. You had a dog. <laughs> damn dog had heartworms, mange, ear mites, bacterial infection. Everything, anything you could think of was wrong with it. It cost me a damn fortune. <laughs> Vet bills. I mean, and anyway, here he is, and I got him. And this is about as healthy a looking dog as I've he, ever seen. Oh, he's got muscles. We're one muscles. He, I run him about a mile, mile every morning and every afternoon. Right. Oh, he's 
the biggest muscles run from ear to ear. <laughs> but, uh, he, he's everybody's friend. Oh, I, I think he must have been involved with a female though, because I got all these damn sorority gals jogging up, and he looks there. Every once in a while, he'll lose it and chase me, run one down, <laughs> and I get a little bit of a snicker because I go out and say, "You can't keep it." <laughs> and it snicker, 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 snicker. Gee, Papa, can I have one of these? <laughs> no, you can't. Oh. He is, he really is. He's a great companion. Oh, I Nom that. nominally, nominally very well behaved. Right. He likes people who just uh, very. Oh well yeah. He's except for that SOB that poked that bird shot in me. He was too young to be. be somebody was trying to try train at him. And he's a great retriever, but he's a lousy giver upper. Yeah. <laughs> he says, if I run that damn thing down, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're a good guy. Oh. You're a good enough guy. You're a. Yeah. And his name is Trooper. Trooper. <laughs> Trooper, you're a good dog. He, he's a good guy. Everybody well, we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do this show on Wednesday, and we tape it uh, at 1:30, and we're over at KAMU. Do you know where that is? KAMU Radio. It's over on campus. So if, Wednesday is the Wednesday at 1:30. 15th. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> you could be there around 1:15. That would be great. And we just. Uh, You've seen the show on now, KMU is that separate building back behind the, or pretty close to the. If you go on George Bush to yeah. Houston Street, you go in there, that's where the, right where the. the police uh, operation is. Yeah, well that's yeah. where it used to be, I think they've moved yeah, now, but, but, but where, the, where the former students student. building is, yeah. and where the, the left. and where the foundation building is, yeah. that's that's Houston Street, yeah. it goes into campus, yeah. right by the side of yeah, Kyle It's up there on the left. Exactly. You oh, go, okay. you go in. It's a one-story building, yeah. and it's on the left, yeah. right when you go on the campus, and you can, uh, you can just turn left into the parking lot right after the building, and park in the back of the building, back back behind the building is where there's parking spots there that you can park, and uh, and uh, if you'll be there Wednesday about one fifteen, and what we do is. Uh, we just sit down in two chairs and we just uh, talk just kind of like we've talked right now. I'll just lead you through it. You've seen the show. You okay. kind of know what we do. And it, we talk for about 27 and a half minutes and uh, I try to get as much in and we'll show some uh, some, some photographs. Well, I've got about six or seven hours of tape stuff we made for over the museum over there. Is that right? Well, see, you haven't been in there first. The first 90 days of Korea was a very dicey situation. Yes, sir. And I was there and on top of it, and I had all, all of my original maps that I used, mm -hmm. charting out where things were and what, uh, what they're the only existing set of maps. Mm -hmm. And so with those, I wound up doing interviews. Mm -hmm on the early days of Korea right? from the air standpoint as it worked with the ground units right? which were beat all to hell. You bet. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there's lots of that stuff. I've done it before. Right. And I prefer to be led. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll be led. You'll be led. I'll lead you just from one to another and, and uh, yeah, it'll go good. It'll, and we go straight. We, we just, what you see on TV is pretty much yeah. The way we we tape it, we don't we don't well, stop. We go for twenty seven. I get pretty minutes. intense about some of this stuff because I lost an awful lot of the trip. Yes, sir. In two wars. Yes, sir. And you tend to to get that way. Well, that's good. That's good. The emotion is 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 the emotion and the intensity is is deserved. And uh, most of the people I talk to are that way. No, this yeah. is not to be discussed on it either. But yes, sir. My best friend was the battalion chaplain, and he was three feet from me when he took one right between the eyes. Mm -hmm. And that, that'll tighten you up a little bit. Was that in World War II? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That'll tighten you up a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for your service, and thank you for uh, uh, for doing this. It's an honor to be able to. Oh, uh, uh, no, that's to another word you don't want in there. Uh, there's an honor bit. Uh,
I'm glad to be here. Mm -hmm. Glad to be able to share. Yes, sir. Glad to be able to help. Yes, sir. And uh, but I think this greatest generation, you know, Miss Nomer, would be the hungry generation. Anything was better than what we had. Sure. And what we just had, was, out of and what we had was worth fighting for. Right. Right. That was all we had to do. We didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think it. I think it. Every once in a while, somebody tries to work up a new. A new name tag. Mm -hmm. And you can't. You can't express a complete feeling in one word or one one phrase. Yes, sir. Oh, I got fussed at over there when I was making taste for them because at the end of about every sentence for a little while I was going, well, it was just what you had to do. You didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. It had to be done. You look around and nobody else to do it. So you do it. Right. There was nothing honorable about that. Right. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Honor implies doing something it impl above ab above what had to be done, above what yeah. you know, it was it was just the way of life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ask a question. Distinguished flying cross over there, a couple of those. Uh huh. Well, I got friends on the ground that are being shot at. They can't find out where the hell was coming from. So you go down and put her on the ground a little bit and dig around, and they start shooting at you, and you find out where the hell they are, and then you shoot back at them. Uh huh. And you go home and patch up the holes. Well. There was only one way. It was either he got killed, or he did. No, it was either he got killed or the other guy got killed. Right. Because they're going to get him, whether they got me or not. They're going to get him. Yeah. Because he couldn't move. Right. Right. And he's still alive today. And I saw him over in Birmingham about a year ago. Uh huh. With Alzheimer's. Uh huh. And believe it or not, that he remembered. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Edward M. Logan. Whatever. I appreciate your I appreciate your service and I understand what you mean by you just, you, you 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 did what what had to be done. You know, it's uh this business saying it's an honor to meet you, I think it's a little subservient. Mm hmm I don't like that. Mm hmm I don't like that. Well, I guess all men are created mm -hmm. equal, but they're only created equal. Right. Right. They don't necessarily remain that way. Right. I guess when I say honor, I more mean. I think I know what you mean. Well, I think I more mean that I I appreciate. That's a better word. I appreciate what what you know you did that you and all who fought in that war did. How many more million? Yeah. You know. See, that's the thing. Right. All of this is coming about simply because of the fact that I've survived. Uh-huh. It's the poor devil that didn't come back is the one you need the story on. Exactly. I exactly. And, and, uh, and that's... Uh, My squad leader, who put his helmet over a Japanese grenade and threw himself on top of the grenade, and died, and I got in the middle of water. He's the one that you ought to be talking to. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't do it. Yeah. Sergeant James Cooley. Right. And there's too many sons and daughters that don't know the story. Oh boy, yeah. Cooley was uh, orphan. Was raised in the Catholic Church, Catholic uh, 
orphanage in New York. And when he got old enough to join the army, that was the only place he had to go. And he needed another home. Mm -hmm. So he joined the army, his regular army. He was at Pearl Harbor. For the 20, 25th, he was in the 25th Division at that time. Uh -huh. And so he went through that. Went through Guadalcanal. Colton McGuire, Arundel, Vela Novella, Luzon, and on Luzon he wound up getting the Medal of Honor for doing that. And when we straightened out his records to send them on back, they always had what they called soldiers' deposits. It had always been there for soldiers. They could take part of their pay and put it away to keep for when they got out, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Cooley ran the company poker game. <laughs> and we sent $60,000 to the Catholic orphanage that he had in his soldiers' deposits. He was a career soldier. Mm -hmm. Now that's a guy. That, mm -hmm. That's a story that needs to be told. And it can't be. Right. Right. Can't be. One of the one of the reasons that I got involved in in telling these stories was because my mother's first husband. He wasn't my father. Yep. He was my brother's father. But my mother's first husband was a uh, a Navy pilot. Uh, he flew F six F Hellcats, uh, and but he was killed in a training mission in Hawaii uh, just before his his unit embarked on the on the Princeton, uh, and uh, I, I've just always been uh, just interested in his story and who he was, and here was a young man who who had a a, a baby that he barely knew and another baby on the way and. Mm. And uh, one of his students accidentally uh, clipped his rudder on a training mission. They were doing a strafing mission uh, over Barking Sands in Hawaii, and uh, and he and he went in, and, and uh, so it, it's it's sort of to uh, it's, it's sort of show my appreciation for him too. Oh, yeah, my part of my family. My best friend was killed off Corpus Christi, of all places. He was a Navy pilot. At the air base. And they're out working uh, some tactical stuff before going to Malta. He was on orders to Malta. Right. And uh, yeah, one of the people came in there and chewed up and gave him chewed up the end of his wing. Mm -hmm. he, he went into the bay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There were. Uh, that was in forty. Luck. That was in forty two. Was in I guess May, April or May of forty two. Right. So, right. Who knows? No guarantees.